Welcome back to the lathe series. Today we're going to be talking about how I built the rail for my lathe and I'll also show you the headstock, how it works and we'll get this all mounted back up so that you can see that process. I will be showing clips throughout this video of me actually building it but I really wanted to focus on uh, the technical aspects because the precision that you put into it at the beginning is what you're going to get out of your finished product. If you haven't seen the beginning of this series, I'll put the link right here. That'll be part one. I also made a part two where you basically see this guy in action. And so I don't plan to fire it up today. That's why I took the motor out, moved it to, to clear out the space a little bit. Uh, I made a bowl in a previous video and I'll put that link right there. Let's get started with the rail. Let me give you a quick rundown here. The bed is 46 and three quarter inches long. Um, you can make this bed as long or as short as you want. If I had to consider how much space this thing would take up, how easy it is to move around, and I decided that about 24 inches uh, will work just fine for my purposes. If you're gonna be trying to turn table legs or anything like that, of course you wanna make your bed longer. The swing on this lathe is just under 13 inches. It's about a 12.75 and so you can put a 12 inch sanding disc on here and of course you can turn something up to about 12 and a half inches in diameter. Uh, also considering uh, any additional material that you're going to have that you need to turn off in order to, to shape it. The basic idea is this. Uh, there are four bolt holes which are designed to uh, bolt down the headstock. Uh, I wanted to be able to remove the headstock and put it back on, but also once it's in place, I wanted to be able to fix it really tightly. And so that's why we're using half inch fasteners. Uh, there's a groove here and in the plans, uh, there are two options. You could route out this uh, dado groove here, which will be just wide enough for this T-track. You could use whatever type of T-track you want uh, I found this one on Amazon for $10 and I decided to give it a try. Uh, I have used a router, which is uh, the other option that you'll see in the plans, and routed out a T-shaped groove uh, in this bed here, which I'll show you in the model right here. One word of caution though, if you're going to do that, uh, you probably want to make your bed out of plywood so that the grain in each level is uh, facing in opposite directions. With the groove along the grain the way you see here, there's a risk that when you tighten it up that you may uh, peel away those flaps here. This is basically a two by 10 that I cut to size and all the dimensions are in the plans, but I cut that to size. Most of the design is based off of making everything square and flat. So you really wanna take your time and make sure that you square up all the sides, that you flatten the top, if you have a planer, that's a, it's a good option to go ahead and run it through the planer. Um, something that I did before I recently got my planer is I would take whatever boards I had and uh, run it across the table saw and use the blade uh, literally to flatten the face. And then I would have to flip it over for pieces that were uh, wider than the depth of my saw blade. The main reason I'm bringing it up is because there are really no excuses, right? Like you can get this done one way or the other. People were woodworking way before power tools and they managed to make things flat and square. So even if you're using hand tools, uh, there's nothing in this design uh, that can't be done with, with really basic tools. It might just take you a little longer. While cutting the dados for this, um, there are obviously the, the two web sections for the double I-beam base. And then there's also this dado groove down the center. Now, if you're going to go with the T-Track here and you need this dado in the top, it's really important that this one is centered. And what I did to maintain that is essentially I took it and ran it across the saw, just so you know what I'm doing here. Uh, I set the blade for as close to center as I could possibly get it, considering even uh, the width of the blade. And then I ran the rail across the table saw and as I take it off you'll see in the video I roll it over and then run it across the saw again and once you've done that now both edges of the groove that you just cut are equidistant from the edges of your board uh, 
Then you're gonna adjust your fence over uh, just a little bit and then do it again. And you keep repeating until you've got your groove uh, centered. And you do wanna creep up on that final dimension. So I was just barely nudging the fence and then I would take the T-track and go ahead and uh, try to wedge it into the groove here. And then I would nudge the fence just a tiny bit, run it across again, flip it over, run it across, and then try to nudge it in there until it just barely fit. And then I knew that my dado groove here was centered down the middle of the rail. After that, it gets pretty simple. It's pretty much what you see here. Uh, I glued everything up. You can see that's a piece of scrap wood that I got from uh, some piece of furniture I saw on the side of the road, I don't know, but it was made out of plywood and I pulled this and that's why it's all ugly and got holes in it. Um, you will also notice that there's some big ugly holes cut over here and that's because uh, I made the rookie mistake of not considering the width of my washers. Once I tried to put the washers and the nuts in there, they were pressed up against this. So kind of a silly mistake, but Anyway, just wasn't thinking about it. And I went ahead and cut this out with my jigsaw. But in the plans, I have fixed that. So uh, if you've got the plans, you won't have to. <laughs> Yours won't look like that. And you will also notice that there's a huge space right here. And that gap, of course, is intentional. And that's for running my cables through because I intend to have a control console right here in the front in a wooden case. And my cables will run back to the motor. Here we have the headstock. And what I want to show you is version number one. I'm showing you this as ugly as this is because I think it's an, an important tip here. And that is whenever you're building something that has important dimensions or it has complicated geometry, that uh, you find the cheapest pieces of wood you have and you make yourself a prototype. In fact, uh, I'll show you another one. This guy right here is one of the earlier prototypes that I made. In fact, uh, you see this in the first video I've got posted on YouTube. And the idea was that I would have my bandsaw mounted on one side of this table and you could flip it over and my router table would be on the other side. And this was designed to save space, something that's uh, near and dear uh, to this tiny shop here. But you can see the geometry is kind of complicated. And in fact, I even made one out of cardboard. And I think I showed that in that first video. But then I made one out of wood. And this really helped me to think through how I was going to build it, uh, how long the arms need to be, and just make sure it would actually work the way I expect it. So prototyping can be very effective. This guy is the same idea. I went ahead and made a prototype of my lathe design because the headstock is really critical. Uh, if it's not square and straight and level, then the rest of your lathe is pretty much junk. I ended up changing the design a little bit. Now there's another thing that I noticed is right along here, because I made those cuts just barely big enough to get this piece in, uh, I had to push really hard and this piece broke uh, right along the grain. Now that's not as much of a problem with plywood, which is what I intended to use anyway. That does show you a weakness here, so I increased the angle of this gusset here and that area is much stronger now. And of course, once it's all glued up, then you've got like a nice solid block, so that makes it really strong. And one other design change is I drill the holes after. Even if it doesn't turn out exactly perfect, the hole alignment and the square face, because we're gonna use that as a reference later, um, you want those to be square with each other. So you'll see me in the video clip over here uh, using a square to line these holes up this way and this way, and then I drilled them after everything was glued up. And of course, this is the final product. So you'll see the holes in the bottom and the ones in the top. And there's just enough space here to get the fastener in. And that's all I needed. Quick word about the uh, reason I went with pillow blocks. Uh, I've seen many lathe designs where they make the whole face out of wood and then they drill a recess for a bearing like this. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that except that it's difficult to do correctly the first time. And I wanted to eliminate that risk. I'm trying to make this easy to build. And so I wanted to, if you're gonna be purchasing bearings anyway, 
uh, why not get some pillow block bearings? I found these, these didn't cost me anything, but pillow block bearings, um, I looked on McMaster Car the other day, and uh, ones very similar to this were like $10, uh, $10 each. And then I looked on uh, Amazon and they were about the same price, so they're not very expensive. And I think uh, the benefit that you get of having the, having the bearings already set, uh, these will never slip out, and they have an exact dimension from the center of this hole to the base, it just makes it a whole lot easier to build and that's what I was going for here is as I was thinking about other people building this lathe uh, I didn't want you to really struggle with it so uh, that's the reason for the pillow block bearings and I'm pointing this out because there are many other options there's nothing wrong with any of them but in my opinion this is a, a really easy way to go so got one more tip here uh, these holes have been lined up but if for some reason you didn't quite drill it right uh, you're welcome to ream this hole out just a little bit larger with the next drill size up and that will allow you to swivel and shift things around in order to get it where you want. Alright, so we need to do one quick calibration before we bolt everything down. There are a couple ways you could approach this, but what I would do is slide it up against this T-track, which I have left just a hair proud, and you're going to slide it along the length of your threaded rod like this and make sure that that gap is even. And mine looks pretty good. And then you also want to go ahead and put it right here in the center, butt it up against your threaded rod and make sure that it's also hitting the center of your threaded rod. Uh, if you don't have that, um, some options you can look at is coming back and drilling out the four holes in the base, making them larger and I have done that for demonstration purposes. It would allow you to wiggle this around a little bit and shift it left and right to make sure you get everything squared up. All right, I've got everything bolted back up. I made sure that it's aligned and now we're gonna get ready to get this guy fully assembled again. Uh, be sure to go ahead and drop your belt in there first. Uh, even though I'm pointing that out for you, I forget to do it almost every time. I want to wrap this video up by answering some of the questions I've received and telling you about some of the additional accessories that you may want to get. Uh, one question that I get a lot is how much is it going to cost to build this? And I think that question really stems from how much stuff you already have. Uh, for example, uh, this lathe cost me very little. In fact, the only reason I bought the sheet of plywood that I bought to make this headstock was just so that it looks a little bit nicer while I'm building it um, because it's going to be unpainted for you know several videos in a row. Uh, other than that, uh, I had enough scraps to build all of the wooden components uh, just laying around in the shop. Uh, even that uh, aluminum angle iron was just a scrap piece from another project. I wanted to purchase a chuck off the shelf so that I could buy additional accessories and adapters and things like that, which is what's in that box there. Uh, I'll put a link in the description if you want to get this particular one. But you don't have to purchase a chuck. Uh, you could make face plates. Uh, I literally made this with like a three inch hole saw and just drilled holes in it so that I could turn bowls. Uh, the one catch with this is I do actually mount this in my chuck. Um, but you could get around that by doing what I did with this guy. When I made my sanding disc, uh, I again using a hole saw, I cut these pieces out, uh, glued them together, and then I drilled out a hole to fit the one inch coupling nut and I epoxied it in. And you can make an adapter just like this and have screws go all the way through, which would allow you to make face plates that can be mounted directly to your one inch threaded rod. Uh, if you have different size bearings, let's say you got some um, smaller bearings laying around and you don't plan to purchase a standard size chuck uh, you can make these things smaller i would say uh, 5 8 and up is good uh, i probably wouldn't go smaller than that but uh, you know these bearings here are another option which i salvaged from some machine i don't remember where i got them from but um, these were also free to me at least and so if i had these kind of bearings laying around i would uh, add some material here so that I could uh, recess the bearings in the face. It just needs to be a really good tight fit and the two holes need to be aligned with each other. Now that's a little bit more challenging to do and that's why I, I went with this option here. 
I am going to be building two tail stocks, uh, one that can actually hold a, a purchased live center. And then in a later video, I'm going to show you how to make a shop made live center, which is uh, pretty easy to do. Probably the most expensive components going back to the question of cost is uh, the fasteners. So you're going to need several coupling nuts and the larger the size of your threaded rod that you go with, the larger the fasteners you're going to need. Um, so I'm using this as sort of a spur drive. And again, uh, this is just threaded rod and a coupling nut. You can see that there's a slot inside of there. And all I did is I cut a short piece of threaded rod. I mounted it, not in the chuck, but uh, with a coupling nut to the threaded rod. So a threaded rod, coupling nut, and then a short piece of threaded rod. I spent it up and cut it with my grinder. If you look at other people's lathe videos, you see a lot of people doing that. So it's a very common practice. Uh, the key is that you make it as spiky as you can because the longer those spikes are, I will make them even longer than what you see here, the better it's going to hold on to that wood as while it's spinning. But if you're going to be building this with a fixed speed motor, say an induction motor, then you need pulleys. And the way I make my pulleys is actually really simple. I just use hole saws. They're going to give you a consistent thickness on the outside, a uh, consistent diameter rather. And the reason you need this bit is after you cut out your pulleys on the hole saw, so I'm going to say uh, make a 3 inch pulley, a 4 inch and a 5 inch pulley. Uh, you need two of each. And you'll have those mounted here and then you'll have it flipped but um, mounted on the other one. And that way you've got a consistent OD across each belt. That'll make belt changing easier. And then you're going to put this on your router table uh, with the bit just barely protruding above the table and you can roll this over your router bit and cut out a groove. So you don't even have to try to, to turn it. If you have a router and a V-shaped groove, which this comes in just about every router set that I've seen, then that's how you're going to make your pulleys and you can make them out of wood. So again, a very cheap option. As far as the plans, um, everything is fully dimensioned in the plans. And so uh, if you get the plans, then it'll be really easy to cut everything out. So even if you feel like there's some things missing from the video, uh, anything that's missing is definitely included here in the written plans. One more question that a couple people have asked is, the, is regarding the size of the motor. Uh, I would say that a half horsepower motor is plenty for uh, just turning things as a hobby in your shop. I mean, if you're going to be spinning very large pieces, you need a larger motor. And that's really the relationship you got to consider. Even if you only have a one third horsepower motor, if you're making small items or you're making pens or something like that, then don't sweat it. Take whatever motor you have and use that. Uh, what the size of the motor will determine is how large a workpiece you can work with. Please take a look at the description. There you'll see links to everything and additional comments. Uh, that's where you'll find uh, the link to purchase the plans if you want to purchase the, the early release version uh, before I get the, the final release, which uh, will cost more. If you have additional questions that I've missed, please leave it in the comments and I'll be happy to get back with you.